reminded of that we were the joy set before him. We were the joy set before him. He went to the cross because he wanted to. Um, that was part of his obedience in his life. And what an honor and a privilege like to think that the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, died for us, right? Um, it wasn't a like, oh man, like why do I have to do this? He didn't have like a kind of a crappy attitude about it. He did it because he delights in us, you guys. He delights in us. He delights in you. He doesn't have a, a negative thought about you. There's no shame that he puts on you. He accepts you just as you are. You were the joy set before him. He's like, ah, that's my girl. Ah, that's my guy. And he died because of that. So this morning, Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you, God, that we were the joy set before you. God, I thank you for the reality of the cross and that you're good. God, I thank you that circumstances in life happen around us, God, but you're good. God, and we can remain in the center of that goodness when everything seems to be going around us and swirling around us, Jesus. So God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for what you're going to do in advance. I already say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
But I feel like the Lord is wanting to do something right now with couples in this room. I want every husband and wife that are here to come and join these other couples that are up here right now. Just come right now. I just feel, or, you know, if you're in a, for example, DJ and Lindsay got engaged last night. We're so excited for them. But right now, I just feel like God is doing something right now for couples. Just come. Just come right now. Just worship together. Worship together. Either stand beside each other. Husbands, stand behind your wife. Father, in Jesus' name, there's no one like you. There's no one like you. And Father, right now, we pray for families. We pray for our homes. We ask for increased glory. We ask for increased purity. We ask for increased intimacy and love to be released in our families, in our homes, beginning with mothers and fathers, Lord, flowing down, the blessing of the Lord flowing down upon the children, Lord, <coughs> flowing across the street to our neighbors. 
Lord, we worship you right now. I ask God that you would heal. I ask God that you would strengthen. I ask, Father, that, Lord, that you would knit us together, Lord, in greater unity in the Spirit. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, do something supernatural. Do something supernatural. Do something supernatural. Do it among us, Father, right now.
promise to come everything that you have spoken will come to pass let it
Jesus, God, you're softening the ground, Jesus, to receive. God, we're so grateful for the reign of your spirit. Father, I thank you that, Lord, when we're feeling dry, when we're feeling desperate, Father, even in our spirits when we're feeling dead, we can always look, Lord, and even though the cloud may be the size of a man's hand, it signifies there's a big rain coming. And, Father, we thank you for that today. And, Father, I thank you for your healing word, Lord God, in this house. Father, I thank you for the way that you have been touching the lives of your people. And Father, we just continue to lift up to you, Lord, the needs that are, Lord, mentioned on the screen this morning. Needs of healing, Lord, continued healing from cancer. Father, people dealing with the aftermaths of strokes, Lord God. Father, we just declare complete healing. No residual side effects at all. Father, we pray Lord God, for those that are dealing with, with heart issues this morning, Father, we just pray that you would reach down your hand and touch them completely. Father, we call forth unblocked arteries in the name of Jesus. Father, we just pray that you would minister 
your life and your love to your people. Father, today, Lord, we lift up to you Pastor Nate Ellerton, Lord, at Compel Church and Temperance this morning. Father, we just pray, Lord God, that your anointing and your power would be on the man of God today. Father, we pray that, Lord, there would be such an anointing in the church, Lord, as they minister, Lord God, in two different locations. Father, that the power of your Holy Spirit would touch lives and souls would be brought into the kingdom. And Father, we lift up missionary Aaron Oginski today, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray, Lord, Lord, as the labor goes forth there with the Mission 25 organization, Lord, there in Cambodia, we pray, Father, for a powerful outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Father, that lives will be transformed in the name of Jesus, that truly your gospel will go to the very farthest reaches of this planet. Father, we love you and we just give you glory and honor and praise this morning. God, you're awesome and we love you and we thank you today. In Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, well, my name is Pastor Kelvin. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I want to welcome everybody today. And if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, we are so delighted to have you here in our service, and we trust that um, you've already sensed one of the things that's very, very important to us, and that's going after the presence of God and our, and our worship and adoration of Him. And uh, we're delighted to have you here, and we would love to be able to connect with you this morning. And you can help us do that in one of two ways. Um, number one, in the seat back in front of you, there's a connection card. Um, you can take that, fill that out completely, or you can go to the website listed there on the screen, and you can do it digitally. Just fill in the information, hit the Submit button, and we will get that. And you can drop that card in the offering here in just a few moments, but we would love for you to stop by our Connect Cafe which is across the hall from the sanctuary. And after the service this morning, Alice McLaughlin is going to be there. Alice, give it up for Alice this morning, would you? Okay. She'll be there to greet you with a warm smile. You can take that card, trade that for a gift that we have for you. She'll be able to answer any questions you might have about Rochester Christian Church, okay? And uh, Rochester, would you do me a favor and put your hands together for our guests this morning one time? Thank you. We love to bring our worship unto the Lord, but also something that's very important to us is that we love to worship God in our giving. And so this morning, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. In your seat back in front of you, you'll find a giving envelope if you'd like to do that. Or you can give two other ways. You can go and you can text give. Just text the word give to the number on the screen. Or you can go download the Church Center app and you can give that way. That's how I give. It's easy. It's fun. You say, I don't know how to download it. Trust me. Pastor Sarah can do it. If she can, anyone can, okay? And she would be glad to help you out. I'm telling you right now, okay? So um, she's, she's proud of that fact. So you can give in one of those ways. Also at this time as we get ready to give, some folks are going to come with the elements of communion and they're going to wait on us this morning. And in just a moment, we're going to pray. And we're going to be releasing you row by row, starting from the front. You'll exit your row to the left when your row is dismissed. You can come on down. If you have an offering, you can place it in the basket. Great time to bring that connection card with you as well. Um, and if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to participate with us in observing the Lord's Supper this morning as we remember what Jesus did on the cross for us, okay? Would you stand with me this morning? Why don't you lift those offerings before the Lord? If you're given by text or whatever, you can lift your phone before the Lord, okay? There we go. I got mine right here. Here we go. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, Lord, with our finances. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to remember what you did for us on Calvary, Lord, as we participate in communion this morning. Father, we thank you, and we just bless these offerings. We bless the gifts and the givers, and we just give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give this morning. Ushers, if you would, begin to release us, please.
morning, church family. Wonderful spring day that we have before us today. You know, the good news of the Bible is that Jesus came to save and set men free. And although there's many different facets of that freedom, that you should know from the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, you became a new creature. And from that moment forward, a transformation began in you that would last you your whole life. You once had an identity as a sinner and you were condemned. And the freedom comes and Jesus set us free in our own hearts. You're no longer identifying that. Now you have a new identity. You are a son and you are a daughter of the living Lord Jesus. In his courts, you are a prince and a princess. You are something and although you're still in this world and you're walking through it and it's got trials and tribulations you know you know your identity and so many of us forget but our identity is in Christ and Paul says even to go one step further not only do you have that identity because you know who you are because you understand who you are by faith you're gonna do many amazing things He's planted gifts in you, and by faith, you could use those gifts to bless each other, to bless the relationships you're in, the people in this church that you serve with. You are a new creature. Lord, thank you so much for your salvation. Thank you for the gifts that you've given us. Lord, and thank you for hiding your identity in us today. Let us take Man, if you would, just pass your cups to the aisles this morning. Rushes will wait on you. And I'll tell you what, because it's such a beautiful day outside, we're going to give you all 60 seconds to get around and just greet one another this morning. If you see somebody you don't know, why don't you take a chance and introduce yourself to them today, okay? God bless you. Let's make our way back to our seats this morning. Got just a few announcements we need to take care of. First of all, this coming Friday night, June 7th, is our first of the month night of worship. Come on out 7 p.m. for a time of worship and praise and intercession. It's a great time to gather together. And uh, Pastor Richard has requested as many people as possible to please join him next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in three days of fasting and prayer. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and we're believing God to see the Holy Spirit just do some awesome things next Sunday. So join with us, if you would, for that. Also, coming up in June, we have VBS Lego Life is coming, okay, for everybody, kids in grades K through 5, June 19th through the 21st. Parents, you can sign up your children today at one of our kiosks or by using the Church Center app. Um, just go to um, Rochester, uh, RC, man, rcchurchlife.com forward slash events. I'll get it eventually. Okay, you can do it that way. But you know what? To have a great VBS, it doesn't take a village, but it takes an awful lot of volunteers, okay? And you can help us out by, if you feel like you want to help out that night, it doesn't matter. Man, if all you've ever done is you've painted a, a turtle with your finger, finger painting, you are qualified to be a volunteer for our VBS you can sign up the same way, rcchurchlife.com forward slash events, and uh, you can sign up for a lot of different areas that we need help with, so please join us in that. 
Also coming up on June 22nd, that's Saturday, is our next membership class from 9 a.m. to noon. Have a light breakfast that we serve, and we go through all the information about what it means to be a member. So we're, we invite you, if you're interested in membership or just want to find out a little more, please sign up for this same thing, rcchurchlife.com forward slash events. And we want um, to let you know today we're honoring our graduates, high school and college graduates. We're going to be doing that in the second service. So maybe if you, you might want to stick around, okay, and help us honor those folks um, that have graduated this year. It's a great thing. And today we are honored to have our co young adult college and career pastor, also our outreach pastor, and she has been doing a phenomenal job helping us focus more attention on that area is going to be bringing the word this morning. Would you do me a favor? Put your hands together for Pastor Sarah Morris. Good morning, church. I'm surprised more of you were not woohooing when he said the beautiful spring day. It's not raining. It's not snowing. It's a miracle in Michigan. We should be cheering. Jesus saves and the sun came out. It's amazing. Um, I just want to say good morning and it is always a privilege to come and get to just bring the word and really just share what the Lord is teaching me. Um, before I do, I want to just share one more opportunity that we have this summer to get involved and to serve. Um, in July, July 20th, we have our big outreach in Pontiac at Baldwin Park and it's called Party in the Park. That day is different than all the other Saturdays that we go on because we are asking other churches to join with us and we want to bless the people of Pontiac very strategically with the word of God, with music, with medical, um, doing children's ministry. There's a lot of different things that take place on that Saturday. We have kids games. We have uh, people can go get their hearts checked. We're looking for toothbrushes to be donated so that we can bless people. There's the clothing area. There are so many different opportunities to get involved on this Saturday that I wanted to invite our church family to come and be the first ones to sign up and to get involved. You can sign up for an hour. You could sign up for the whole day. You could sign up for something specific in an area that maybe like face painting, maybe serving food. Maybe you love kids and you want to be involved with their kids crafts. That is not the area I will be signing up for. Not a craft person. It would be a fail. But maybe you are not a failure in that area. And so I wanted to invite you guys to come and get involved that Saturday. You can just show up, but it would really help us out if you signed up. You can sign up online. You can talk to me about it. You can talk to anyone else on staff. But we would love for you to get involved and be a part of this. One thing I'm very excited is this year we are actually going to do a karaoke contest, a Motown karaoke contest, where we're going to be giving a couple hundred dollars away and gift cards to the surrounding areas um, to include the adults. Because how many of you know that music just brings us together? Sometimes in a painful way and sometimes in a really great way. Um, so I'm super excited about that. So make sure you mark your calendars, come down and serve with us this summer. If you have your Bibles with you this morning or your cell phones, you can open up to your church app and open up to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I still like to hear the pages. Shh, I'll do it right here so I can hear myself. Um, Romans chapter 12. And the title of my message this morning is called Welcome Home. Welcome Home. And we're going to just jump in to the word this morning. And this is just something that Holy Spirit's just been teaching me about. So you're just getting a sneak peek into my devotional life. All right. Are we ready? Yes. All right. Oh, I like, he's, he never here when I'm here. And I like when somebody actually talks back to me. So feel free. Hallelujah. I receive it. Yep. Okay. All right. So Romans chapter 12, it's also on the screen and you can read with me. It says, therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Verse three, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment 
in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, verse 5 is so big, so in Christ, though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to one another. I think Mark actually got my notes before he came and did communion this morning. Verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance to your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it, is, if it is teaching, then teach. And if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. And if it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Verse 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and share with the Lord's people who are in need, and practice hospitality. Man, that is, would take months for us to do an amazing study on this passage of scripture that Paul was writing to the believers in Rome. And this morning, I just want to take a few nuggets and I want to unpack what Paul is challenging the church in Rome with. And the first thing I want to do before we even get into that, I want to ask us a question this morning. How many of you have ever felt like you do not belong somewhere? Any of you know what that feeling's like? All right. How many of you would say that that was a good experience? No. Right? What kind of feelings come up when you're in a place, when you show up and you're in an environment where you feel like you don't belong? Can you think of the last time? This is actually, this is your little challenge right now. Can you think of the last time that you were in a place where you felt like you did not belong? You can smile at me when you remember, all right? Some of you, it's right now, in this moment. You're like, ah, uh, yeah? All right, I see a couple smiles. I'm waiting for all of you. This is interaction time. Oh, a few more over there in the back. All right. Anyone on this side? All right. Well, I was thinking about this because about a week and a half ago, my daughter, who's a fifth grader at uh, Oxford uh, Elementary School, she asked me to go and for three days and two nights to go and be a parent volunteer at fifth grade camp. All right? When your 11-year-old looks at you and says, Mom, I so want you to be my camp counselor, your first reaction is, yes! Right? No, that wasn't my first reaction. My first reaction should have been, yes, I know, of course, I would love to. My first reaction was, oh, man. I mean, I'm just being real. The thought of having to sleep with 15 fifth grade girls in a dorm room on a bunk bed with one of them up there moving around all night long did not sound super exciting. Talk about taking off of work, having to get the rest of my kids taken care of. It just was a big to-do. But I said, Josie, I'll think about it. And I saw the little shoulders. <sighs> because my children always say, when mom says she's going to think about it, it's probably no. Right? But I actually did think about it. And I prayed about it. I talked to Ben about it. And at the end of the day, I felt like the Lord was saying, just go. This moment doesn't last forever. Enjoy being with your daughter. She's not going to want to have you with her when she's 16 years old. So enjoy the moments, right? Yes, okay. Maybe my 16-year-old will be different. Thank you, Jesus. You know, she's still going to hold my hand, maybe. But you know what? I constantly am being told, enjoy the moments, right? And so in this moment, I actually did it. Not always, don't always do it. Uh, but in this moment, so I signed up for camp. I paid the money. It was ridiculous, but I paid. And we would go to camp. And can I tell you, from the time that I pulled in to this fifth grade camp, I realized I do not belong. Right? A bunch of kids about to hit puberty. Oh, it's an amazing experience. Just a bunch of awkward kids. Oh, I loved it. It was so 
interesting to be able to watch the dynamics between the guys and the girls and some of the girls actually starting to like the guys and some of the girls are oblivious to the guys and they're starting to smell and they're growing and they're super short. I mean, it is just an amazing, amazing thing to watch. But the first thing we do right when we pull into camp is we all head into the cafeteria. There's other parents, chaperones. There's like for every kid, there's like, um, I think for every seven kids, there's a chaperone. So there's a lot of adults that are staying. There's adults that just volunteered for the day. And so immediately when I come in, I get my kids stuff. I put them all in their rooms and we go in and all the seats are filled. Have you ever been in a place when you walk in and you're supposed to sit down and there's no seats for you? Awkward, right? This is my start to fifth grade camp. So I have to go in the corner, pull out a chair, and all the other parents are like cuddled up at different tables, awaiting to find out what our next assignment is. All the kids are around their tables sitting with their little people, and I'm trying to decide, where do I sit, right? Because my girls at this point don't know who I am, so it'll be awkward if I go and say, hi, I'm Miss Sarah, I'm gonna hang out with you all week, that's weird. And the parents, there was no room in the inn. So I was like, where am I gonna sit? So I decide, you know what? My fifth grade daughter wants me here. I'm sitting right next to her. <laughs> so I pushed the kids out of the way and I sat right next to Josie because that was my comfort zone. That was my comfort zone. I didn't know the parents that were there. My friends that were actually coming, they weren't coming till the next day. And so I didn't know any of the parents in this room. And it is amazing to watch that in many ways, it was no different between the adults than it was with the fifth graders. People stick with what they know. They immediately take care of, do I have my friend circle around me? Am I comfortable? So often in life, we work so hard to try to belong, to have that feeling, to have that confidence of being known. That confidence that says, there's room for you. We see you. You matter. You are valuable. And we actually do. We go above and beyond to try to avoid situations in life where we don't belong. And as I was sitting in that room and I was watching the different dynamics between the kids, the adults, being aware of my own feelings of insecurity, it is amazing. All of a sudden, I start looking at what I'm wearing. I started thinking, man, maybe I should have done my hair. Because these people did their hair. I was showing up for camp. All of a sudden, I start thinking, what did I pack in my suitcase? I packed camp clothes, and these people look like they're coming off of a magazine. I didn't realize this was the type of fifth grade camp I was going to. It is amazing how quickly, when you feel like you don't belong, how you start beginning to start criticizing and scrutinizing and, and, and questioning the decisions that you made earlier. And all of a sudden, what meant to be an awesome opportunity to connect with my daughter, an awesome opportunity to connect with fifth grade girls and let the love of Jesus flow out of me, all of a sudden became a moment where I started feeling trapped by my own insecurities because of the feelings of not belonging. You see, Paul was writing to the church in Romans and he was saying this amazing point. All of those verses I read, I know there were so many different parts of them, but as I studied the book of, uh, the study of, the book of Romans, one of the things that so jumped out and the Holy Spirit has been reminding me of is this. Paul is saying to the church, we are a spiritual family. We are, when you become a believer in Christ, when you become a follower of Jesus, you leave your individualism alone, your singularity, your time of unbelonging. You leave that with your sin and you get to enter into this new identity as a son or daughter into a place where you always belong. Yes. Paul is saying there is a major change that is supposed to take place, not just forgiveness, not just walking, not, oh, I'm not going to live a life of sin. There is a powerful identity change that Mark alluded to that Paul is reminding the church. 
Although we are different, we have different giftings, we have different abilities, we have different strengths, we have different weaknesses, we have different personalities. Paul is saying, although all of that is present, there is something that is beautiful and is so powerful. If we can get a reality and a revelation of what this means to your soul. In Christ, Paul says in verse 5, though we are many, we form one body and each member belongs to each other. Church, can I remind every one of us this morning, myself included, that wherever you are, wherever you go, you always belong. When you walk into this church, whether your feelings tell you something differently, whether you walk into your job or you walk into your marriage, whether you walk into a park, you are always in the position and the identity as one who belongs to Christ. And your identity has got to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Paul is saying there has got to be a shift in our thinking. There has got to be a shift in our thinking. Because we cannot live out this spiritual family, we cannot live out this amazing truth, this amazing new spiritual reality that we have, we cannot live it until we're transformed up here. Why? Think about it. In our natural nature... Who do we look out for? Self, right? It's in our natural nature to protect, to try to actually, you know, become the everything we're supposed to become. There's a natural bend to actually be absorbed with oneself. It's very, it's it's almost like the, it's like a picture between somebody who is an individual versus somebody who is a family of five or six children. Think about the differences in the way you prioritize your time. Think about the differences in your family growing up. Someone who only has to think about their own decisions, there's nothing wrong with that person. That is a natural way of of living. When they wake up in the morning, they get themselves ready. They eat their own breakfast. They go to their jobs or to school, and then they think, What do I want to do tonight? What would that be like? (laughs) Right? But when you're part of a family, when you're part of a family that actually life isn't just revolving around just what you want, not because someone's better or worse, there's just a difference in reality. The person who has to make decisions based on their family wakes up in the morning maybe two hours earlier than needed, just so they can might have be a little bit alone with their cup of coffee, before they wake up their children, before do they go to that job that isn't their favorite, but they needed more finances to make money to provide for their family's needs, so they don't work their dream job that just makes them feel good inside. But they do it day in and day out to provide for the needs of their family. And when they get off work, their first thought isn't in their mind, what am I going to do with my free time? My thought is, what did my wife plan for me tonight? Or what do my kids have going on? Or take a deep breath. I'm about to go in. (laughs) Right? One is not better or worse. They're just different. And Paul, in the beginning of Romans, is talking to the church, and he's saying, Church, when you became a believer in Christ, you entered into a new reality. And this new reality is not a singular. It's not about individuals. It is about being a part of a family. It is being a part of a place where you belong, and also that everyone belongs. And that is good news. Because in life, let's get real. We all have moments where we feel like we don't belong. We all will walk into situations where our emotions are telling us, I am not one of them. I don't belong. They don't like me. I don't fit in. You all raise your hands. I know it's true. 
And when I was on that fifth grade camp trip, I had a fight between reality and between what my feelings were telling me. The entire trip. Because people are clicky. I was out of my comfort zone. People didn't know who I was. They didn't care who I was. They had their own group, and that's okay. But I had to continually walk this out, and that is why I believe Paul, at the very beginning of Romans, says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, again, highlighting that family mentality, who you are, your beloved identity, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You see, we'll never sacrifice our own feelings for truth unless we understand that this is actually spiritual worship. More than singing a song on a Sunday or with Bethel in your room, worship actually means choosing to do what's right, choosing to say, I'm going to die to myself and my own feelings for a higher reality. That is our spiritual worship. Yes. But Paul doesn't go on. He doesn't stop there. Look what he says. He says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is a daily opportunity. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and po proper worship. Oh, this is a big part. He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Isn't it interesting that that verse follows right after offering our bodies up as a living sacrifice? Why is that? Why is Paul on the heels of saying we are a family and our true worship is actually living in such a way that we're sacrificing maybe our natural bent, our natural nature to live in a higher reality? I believe Paul is saying this. The only way we're going to be able to do this is if we daily fight, if we daily get our minds in truth so that we can actually allow ourselves to be transformed by the power of God so that we can actually start believing truth in our, in our hearts and not just in our heads. Yes. Because what the way we react when we feel like we don't belong is an indicator of really how transformed we are. The way we respond in situations when we feel insecure, when we have those emotions, those thoughts, like we just don't add up. No one is even noticing me. I'm never going to come back here again. Those are all real. There's nothing wrong with those feelings or those emotions. But Paul's saying in that moment... When you're feeling it and you know it's going against the reality that you are beloved son and daughter of God, that you are a part of a spiritual family, regardless of whether people are treating you good or not, if it's going against the reality of the truth of God, what are you going to do in that moment? And Paul says, in that moment, the greatest sacrifice you could make, the greatest act of worship you could make to Jesus is to capture those lies of the enemy, capture your flesh, and you throw them on the ground and you say, you know what? I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of yes. my mind. I am going to let the Holy Spirit remind me of who I am. Yes. So that I can allow life and peace and godliness to flow out of me. You see, what's the purpose of it all? God's purpose is not just that we would feel that we would belong. God's purpose is that all would know that they belong. God's desire is that not only would we have this revelation that changes our lives because we know our identity, we know it's not based on what we do, we know it's not based on how we look, we know that our identity is rooted in the one who loved us first. And when you get experience that reality, you're willing to throw up your hands and say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Whatever you want me to do. Isn't that what he, Paul later on says in the Church of Corinthians? He says, when you were called, most of us, when we were called, we, you weren't anything special. You didn't have the highest education. You weren't part of the elite. God called us right where we were because he saw us. Because you matter. But Paul is saying, we've got to get the reality that we are a spiritual family. And that every person is included in this family and God's desire is that the whole world would be a part of it. Amen. 
So the challenge is as a church, as in as believers, as followers of Jesus, the challenge is, is to fight and to spend time with the Lord and to renew our minds. So that when we walk into moments, that the love of God needs to be so present that we have something to give. You see, when I was on that fifth grade trip, as I said, I was battling back and forth the whole time. I'm telling you this because there's nobody that is disqualified from this. I just want to let you in. That's why I share all my weaknesses because I want you to know it doesn't matter what personality. It doesn't matter what calling you have, what you do for your job. It doesn't matter what family you were raised in. Everybody struggles with insecurity. Everybody wants to feel like they belong. And so while I was there at that camp and just having to literally just keep telling myself, I'm here for my daughter, I'm here for my daughter, the Holy Spirit kept saying, no, you're not. You're here for so much more. But if you don't get your focus off yourself, you're going to miss the opportunities that I have for you. Ouch! And I remember sitting on this picnic table. At one point, I was sitting at the picnic table. The kids were doing this, listening to some bird listening thing. I don't know what they were doing. But they were all doing something. So I didn't have have a job to do at the time. And so I was very aware that I was sitting by myself. To the right was all the parents that, like, were all super close and already knew each other for years past. And, you know, scattered among them was the other people that, you know, didn't have anyone to sit with either. And so I'm just sitting there. And I was starting to have my little pity party moment, you know, like, where you're just feeling like, eh. And, um... And I I remember the Holy Spirit. I know it was the Holy Spirit just kind of tapping me. Just tapping me. And I'm like, what? You know? Because you don't always want to listen to Holy Ghost. And uh, and I just feel this. He's not tapping my shoulder. I'm doing this, but it's like a, you know, like in my heart I'm feeling it, okay? I don't want to confuse you. Some of you are like, I don't feel the tapping. It's not a real tapping, okay? Um, It's the Holy Spirit. And I just keep, this phrase just keeps coming over. Who are you, Sarah? Who are you? And I knew instantly, because I've been studying Romans, and I knew instantly what the Holy Spirit was reminding me of. So I said, Holy Ghost, if I'm your beloved, if I'm your daughter, then I can sit here at rest and peace and be everything you called me to be in this moment. And so I just invited Holy Spirit right there. While that guy was talking about nature, I just sat there and said, Holy Ghost, be with me. It took one minute. It wasn't a big deal. The the heavens didn't open. Nothing. Nothing. But a change happened inside, and I felt his peace, and I felt his confidence. I felt their tra- being transformed by the renewing of my mind taking place. There was a transformation. And so then I said, Holy Spirit, who do you want me to reach out to? Who is sitting alone? Who is somebody that I can reach out? Can I tell you the most attractive thing to people is people who love? People who love and who are at rest and are walking in freedom. Because you know what? Most of us ever don't ever get out of that place of feeling awkward. We overcompensate. We act, you know, whether some of us shut down, some of us overtalk, that seems to be my problem. It, it, we all do something when we feel awkward. Yet there is something that is so enjoyable about a person who is secure in who they are. And Paul is saying it is so important to function in your identity because people need to be invited to belong. As we go on, I just want to quickly say really fast, I want to look at verse 9. One last time, verse 9. This is how Paul says, this is how we do it. This is how the rubber meets the road. When we get this amazing revelation that we're a part of a spiritual family, it's not just an individual thing. Why do we come to church? It's not just for you. We come because we're a spiritual family. When you come in this doors, it's not about what you're feeling. It's about what is truth. Did you know there are some days I come to work and I feel like I don't belong at a church that I've been for 17 years? It's real. And if everyone got real, we all have moments, right? In our marriages, in our neighborhoods, at our jobs, with our friendships. This, we've got to grab a hold and we've got to ask Holy Spirit to give us a revelation of this. You belong because of Christ. But Paul says, how do we flesh this out? How do we do this? How do we fight for community? How do we fight for spiritual family? Because once we get the revelation, that's just the first step. We've got to actually fight to make this happen. And this is what Paul says. This is the how-to. Verse 9. 
Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. In a nutshell, this is what I believe Paul is saying. Be someone people want to be with. Be real and be joyful. Be somebody people want to be with. Be real and be joyful. This is a case in point. When Jesus walked around on this earth, did he belong on earth? No. He actually left the place of belonging. All the angels, all of heaven knew his reputation. He was the man. He is the king of kings. He is, he is amazing. He is the savior of the world. He is the great I am. Everything he had to come to earth and explain, all of heaven already knew. He was comfortable. He was known. He was loved. And yet he chose to leave it to come to a place where he did not belong. And he was human. He had emotions. He had feelings. And what do we see Jesus doing with those? How did Jesus walk and live while he was here, although he did not fully belong? Jesus was real. Jesus was somebody people wanted to be with. I believe we get a picture of it from when he was baptized. Jesus functioned out of who his beloved identity was. And he was not striving to be everybody's friend. Jesus was confident. And he fought to stay in his beloved identity at every age and season of his life, regardless of his job, regardless of his family, because you never once see Jesus striving. You never once see Jesus put someone else down so that he could be feeling a little bit better about himself. You actually see such a, such a sincerity in Jesus that when people were around, he turned it about them. He was somebody who asked questions. He was somebody who wanted to be a part of people's lives. You see, the only way that we can truly love and allow people to want to be around us is if we are confident in who God made us to be, and then we can allow the love of Jesus to flow out of us, and we can actually make it about somebody else. Amen. Jesus was somebody that sinners and believers wanted to be with. Yes. He was misunderstood and yet not bent out of shape by it. Because there was a quiet security inside of him that says, you don't understand who I am, but I know. Can I tell you that we're going to misunderstand each other? We're going to judge each other wrongly at times because we're human. But if we could wrestle with the fact that we are not our own, that Jesus loves us, and that we can find a place where it doesn't matter how our work is going, how our kids are going, how, how what we have and what we don't have, what I look like or I don't look like, or am, am I doing the things I'm supposed to be doing? If we could get to the point where we're, we're finding our rest and our peace in what God says about us, then there's a realness. There's a vulnerability. Because there's no proving. Those are the type of people that are so attractive. Right. Jesus attracted people everywhere he went because he wasn't striving. Because he was real. He walked in humility. We are the most attractive when we are free and we are at rest. Jesus, the second thing I think Jesus did and, and what we see in the garden is Jesus gave his emotions to the Father. Jesus gave his emotions to the Father. We, I hear so often we put down our emotions, we put down our feelings. God gave you those. There's nothing wrong with having feelings and emotions. Actually, if you don't, it means you're not alive. It means something's dying inside. And so when you feel insecure, when you feel those feelings of inadequacy, church, don't beat yourself up. Those are human emotions. We live in a fallen world, and all of us desire unfailing love. All of us desire to belong. But Paul is reminding us through the scripture, it's what are we going to do with them when we're in those moments so it doesn't take you out of the game. 
Jesus actually brought his emotions and his feelings, and they were different than what, what he wanted. He did not want to die on a cross. Jesus in the garden goes and says, I don't want to do this. One quick thought. Did Jesus go by himself to the garden, or he, did he do that with others? Man, that's so painful. Community. Jesus lived this out. He lived with spiritual family. He was not a lone ranger. He was not somebody that was like, nope, I'm more spiritual than you all. I just do it on my own. No. In his greatest moment of fighting, this spiritual warfare, this is spiritual warfare. When we're fighting in between our head and our heart, that is what spiritual warfare is. Jesus comes and he brings it to the Father and he says, I don't want to do this. When I was sitting on that picnic table, that is what I was really saying to God. I don't want to do this. I want to pack my bags and go home and sleep in a real bed and be with people who like me. <laughs> right? And let's get real. We probably have those feelings probably a lot during the day. But Jesus in the moment modeled for us what we can do. We can offer up those feelings to the Lord because God cares. He cares about our heart. He cares about our feelings. And Jesus prayed through. And he said, at the end of the day, God, I give you, I tell you what I'm thinking, I tell you what I'm feeling, but in the end of the day, I'll trust you. Not my will, but your will be done. Because Jesus knew that if he didn't deal with his emotions, he was never going to be able to love people really. Church, if we try to stuff it down and try to be like robots, it's, we're never going to have the capacity to love. Right. We're never going to have the capacity to be people that attract people and actually help people to belong if we have no feelings. So we've got to fight for our hearts. Jesus gave his emotions. The second thing I want to point out, and this is what I'm just, we'll be ending with this, is Paul is saying we have got to be the people who initiate relationship. Paul says we've got to be the one to be the ones who initiate relationship. He says, be devoted to one another and practice hospitality. Now, can, was he talking to uh, the people that prophesy and to the people that have hospitality gifts? Was he talking to the ones that are teachers and have gifts of mercy? Right? Paul's talking to the entire body. He's talking to the entire spiritual family. This is not set for just one or the other. Why? Because Paul is speaking in the, entire, the entirety to his spiritual family. Think about this. If you're thinking as an individual, you're going to say other people have different jobs. We don't all have to do it. Well, I'm an intercessor. I don't need to love. I don't need to fight for unity because I just pray and I intercede. No, Paul's saying this is we've got to fight to be devoted one to another. That is all of our jobs in the spiritual family. When my two kids are fighting, do you think it makes our whole home peaceful? No, because both of them are fighting to be their own person. They're both fighting to say, I want it my way. And our home does not have peace. And then my neighbors and other people don't want to be there while I'm yelling at my children. Right? We're working on calmly speaking to them. They don't quite listen to that yet. Okay. The point is, Paul's saying as a family, as a spiritual family, it is all of our jobs to fight to be devoted to one another. Amen. That means we have to be people who forgive when we are offended. Right. That means we have to be people who lay aside our preferences so that we can connect with people that we don't normally connect with. Right. It bothers so many people that Jesus hung out with sinners. Church. He loved he knew what it felt like to not belong. He left heaven. And Jesus' desire is that everybody would know belonging. Yes. We have got to remember it's about a family. Yes. And so we've got to be the people who initiate relationships to invite, to invite, and then welcome them in when they finally come. Amen. It's going to look different for every person in this room. It's going to look different for every person who's watching live stream. It's going to look different, but all of us are called to be devoted to one another and practice hospitality. Jesus welcomed strangers into his life. Jesus invited strangers into his life. Believers and non-believers. 
Jesus lived ordinary hospitality that made strangers into family members. Let me say it again. Jesus lived ordinary hospitality that made strangers into family members. Come follow me. Come follow me. Come see. Why don't you come for see for yourself? Come follow me. Man, if you drink with what I have, I'll have everlasting life. Jesus lived in a way that drew people to him because he knew everybody desired to belong. And belonging doesn't matter if you're doing the right things. Belonging doesn't matter if you believe the right things. Yet God said in Ephesians that he desires that everyone would become brothers and sisters in the Lord. Sons and daughters. Yes. God said for the, he loved the whole world that he gave his son. Yes. God's desire is that we would practice ordinary hospitality everywhere you go. At the yes. grocery store. At the gym. Yes. At school. To the cash register. Everywhere we go. Yes. So that you can have an opportunity to let the love of God flow out oh. of you. And to allow somebody for a moment to feel like they belong. Yes. Amen. We can only do that when we function out of who God made us to be. When we give what we have been given. Jesus gave what he had been given. Jesus on this earth had to walk and take his thoughts and renew his mind just like we did. He did not belong on earth. And yet he functioned in a way that brought belonging everywhere he went. Church, that is what Paul is inviting us to. He's inviting us at every season and stage of life. Whether you're graduating high school, whether you're starting a new job, whether you're becoming empty nesters, whether you're, whatever transition, whatever moment you're in, God's inviting us to remember that it is in our weakness that he is made strong. It's in the times that we feel unable, incapable, un, we, we don't have the strength in of ourselves. That is when God says, will you invite me into this situation because you don't have to do this on your own? Will you let me fill you in this moment? You know what the awesome thing is about living out of your comfort zone? Is that we're more dependent on him. You see that fifth grade camp? In many ways to my flesh was the worst three days of my life. To my flesh. But can I tell you that when I came home, I was beaming. Because there's something about the life that you get to have flowing through you. It's the life of God. When you live in your weakness and you allow the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what Paul said? My grace is sufficient in your weakness. When you allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you on your job, in your school, in your marriage, in your parenting, wherever you're at, when you are like, man, I am weak, I'm insecure, I feel like I don't know what to do, and we stop, that is when our desire for more of God's presence happens. When we live there, when we live in a place where it's not just about me, it's about this whole spiritual family thing. Jesus invites, invites, and welcomes. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? If we're going to be followers of Jesus, are we going to start being people that people want to be around? Will we say, I need to spend more time with Jesus in the morning. I need to pray on my way to my job. I need to spend time with him because I need to be a person who is secure in who God made me to be full of the Holy Ghost, so that I have something to give, to actually invite people into belonging. Will I be somebody who invites and invites, and I'm not talking about inviting people to church. You can do that. But I'm talking about inviting them into your world. Yes. Jesus didn't have a house. But you see him inviting people every single moment right. to engage to share his life. There was nothing that Jesus didn't share with people. That's what hospitality is. It's being somebody who people can be a part and belong. Can I tell you that by the end of that fifth grade camp, I didn't have a huge group that I belonged to, but there was three of us moms who by the end we all belonged. And we exchanged numbers 
And they all want to be a part of our world. Why? Because there was a moment on that picnic table where I had to say, am I going to die to myself? Am I going to be tra- let the Holy Spirit transform my mind with truth? Am I going to give God my emotions? Am I going to say, I have nothing to offer? And will I allow just the love of God? Will I just be secure in who God made me to be and not strive? You see, as I sat there, actually the longer I sat there, more moms started coming to sit by me. And yeah, they weren't the group that already belonged, but it was the ones that didn't have anyone to sit with. There's always somebody that needs you to invite them into your home, that needs you to invite them out to lunch, that needs you just to invite them to speak words of life in a moment. And all of us are qualified. All of us are capable. Because we all needed to be loved and to belong. So church, let us bow our heads and we'll close our eyes. And I just want to pray a blessing over you this week. Holy Spirit, I just thank you so much for giving us the revelation that you love us. That there is a God who loves us, not based on what we do, not based on our performance, not based on whether we believed rightly or not. I thank you that you love us. And that it was your idea to invite us into family. It was your idea to give us a new identity and to say that we belong forever with you and to each other. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to grant us a revelation of what it means to be a child of God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to let go of the past lies, the the things that continually hold us back from grabbing a hold of those truths. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to surrender them to you. I ask, God, that you would give us a revelation that we are a spiritual family. And that is not somebody else's job to make me feel welcome. It is my job to know that I belong. And it is my job to initiate relationships with others. I pray, God, for courage to step out of our comfort zone, to step into a place where we are actually weak and a place where we can allow your love and your passion and your anointing to flow through us. And I ask Holy Spirit for divine appointments. I ask for divine appointments. I ask for new eyes to see this week. God, people, individuals that we can ask and invite into a family way before they ever believe. I ask for divine appointments to make strangers into family members. Opportunities to speak words of life, words of belonging with neighbors, coworkers, family members, children. God, we cannot do this on our own. We're selfish in our nature. And so we ask right now for your help. If that's you and you'd say, God, I want, I need, I just want help. I want to make a fresh commitment to let your love flow through me. If that's just you, I don't, I'm not looking. My eyes are closed. You just raise your hand up to the Lord. Can we just ask him right now? Say, Holy Spirit, I need your strength. Help me to throw off my selfishness. Help me to throw off my insecurity and let your love flow through me this week. Father, you see the hands that are raised. You see the hearts, God, that are saying, I want to be used again. I want to live in the reality that we are a spiritual family, that you have given me everything that I need. And out of the love that I receive, I want to release love to others. I bless my friends. I bless this amazing church family. And I just say thank you, God, in advance. I thank you for the testimonies and the moments that we are going to get to celebrate. Your amazing love and your precious name. Amen. Amen. So church, as you leave today, your challenge is to be somebody. Someone wants to be around. And this is the first step. Everyone practice. Look at your neighbor. Please stop frowning.
Smile at people. We love you. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>